So let's start. How, how and why? Same with Mary. How was he erased and why would somebody want to erase him? Now, this is uh, November 2002, and you can see this wonderful display at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. Some of you might have been at the Society of Biblical Literature meeting. I can't remember. Yeah, I, Bible Fest went to Toronto as well that year, so I bet some of you were there. We can talk about that later. Uh, and this exhibit was an after hours private exhibit for scholars. And I happened to be with Herschel Shanks, as it wasn't announced. Uh, the exhibit was announced, but he had to wait in line for hours to see it, and it did draw a lot of people. But this ossuary was on display with all sorts of history, and the magazine had not come out. So this was an after hours display. I think we went over there at about eight o'clock. And you might recognize some of the scholars. There's Stephen Fawn. There's James Tabor's back right there. That's Kyle McCarter. You can see Herschel's hat right there. Uh, my wife, Lori, took these pictures that you're going to see, all of them. And she did such a great job that BAR asked to use them. So her photos are the pictures that you see in Bar Magazine uh, of this event. So, Ossuary reading James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. Um, Jesus is a fairly common name, but not that common. 4.7% of males were named Jesus. Joseph was a fairly common male name. James, though not. Yaakov or James was, is a pretty rare name. It's less than 1%. So, when you have a James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus, that sort of locks in a cluster because now you have three. So that's how stats work. You have to ask questions, you know, well, could there be another James who was, had a father named Joseph and a brother named Jesus? You'll hear people that are downplaying it say, yeah, there could be dozens like that. But if you begin to look at the stats, you realize that it, it would be fairly rare. Uh, what often happens you know, even though, for example, Mary is the most common female name, one of the two most common female names in the time of Jesus for J Jewish women. But that would mean half of the people didn't have a mother named Mary. So you can, you can cut down very quickly to half. And then if you add, well, who, who had a father named Joseph as well? And that cuts it way down as well. And then if you throw in James. So the stats are very interesting. This is the picture that Lori took of the ossuary. Uh, she, she got a really good shot of it. It had cracked in transit from Israel, unfortunately, and a crack actually ran through part of the inscription, which is not cool. Here you can see the inscription. Let me see if I can make it. Whoops, that doesn't do it. Uh, I was gonna try enlarging it, but I think it's okay. These are full screen for me. Anyway, I'm going to give you close-ups. It's a really plain ossuary. On the back, there's some faded uh, designs, but they look like they weren't even finished, maybe, rather than just faded. Um, anyway, here you can see some of the scholars that are talking. Uh, this is, of course, Frank Cross. This is Herschel Shanks, and they're they're beginning to consult. They've they've just heard about this, and they're these particular scholars are epigraphers, so they're very interested in the letters and how they're formed, especially on stone. Uh, this picture is a little out of focus, but I had to show you Forrest Gump here uh, over to the side. I'm getting to overhear uh, three of the greatest scholar, two of the greatest scholars, and I think Kyle McCarter's back there too. And, and I'm pulled up by Herschel. He pulled my arm up. He said, come up here, James. <laughs> and he always kind of looked out for me. So I got to stand with these great people as they talked about. That was really a high moment for me. And of course, you couldn't touch the ossuary, but as you can see, it's well lit up. So here was the chronology. In the spring of 202, this went really fast. 
Oded Galan, who is the owner of the ossuary in Israel, met with André Lemaire, who's the epigrapher uh, in France. And Lemaire pronounced the inscription valid. Then in October, there was a Bass News Conference announcing it, so that caused a lot of attention. Then there was the exhibit, that's these pictures we just looked at. And then here it is, November, December 202, Biblical Archaeology Review cover. If you're a member of the Bass Library, which I hope all of you will either join or if you're already a member, make use of it. It's just such a great bargain. It's very reasonable financially and you get, I think, 9,000 articles. It's every issue of Bar, every issue of Bible Review, all sorts of extra free books, articles, every issue of Odyssey magazine. It's just amazing. Anyway, you can look this up. But this morning, I was just curious, so I went to the library and I, I typed in James Ossuary, and there are hundreds of subsequent articles after this. So it became quite a, quite a crusade. This was the cover uh, of, and you can see the date, I believe is November, December 202. And it really caused to stir evidence of Jesus written in stone. This is how everybody approached it. Ashwari of James, the brother of Jesus, found in Jerusalem. Now, then it got picked up worldwide by all the news organizations, all the networks picked it up, magazines and so forth. Everybody was all excited. You did have your naysayers pretty early on, and there were already meetings at the Society of Biblical Literature that week where they were having sessions where Lemaire spoke and Golan was there, the owner, John Painter was there and Eric Myers got up, I believe he was president of ASOR then, and he denounced the whole thing because he, he was against uh, unprovidence artifacts being exhibited. In other words, if we don't know where it was found and when it was found and it was not in a controlled archaeological dig, we shouldn't give it any attention because it could be a forgery and we just don't know its history. That is the position of quite a few scholars, including the former editor of Bar, Robert Cargill. As you remember, he announced, what was it, a year ago, that Bar magazine will never, ever include, at least as long as he's editor, I guess, um, anything that's not provenance. So you remember the pomegranate, the little pomegranate that's in the Israel Museum, uh, some of the other things that have been doubted as maybe forgeries, but we also have the Dead Sea Scrolls, most of which are on Providence. So it's a touchy subject. Herschel had his view of it. Uh, he certainly didn't traffic in antiquities trading. He was certainly against that, but he also felt that things were not set up legally so that uh, something could come to the fore that is important. So it's a tough question, but anyway, it was out there and it caused a lot of attention. What I wanna focus on is this, James, brother of Jesus. I can't tell you how many times before this, I would be teaching and I would start, come to this section about Jesus and he died and then how James took over the leadership of the church. And I would see these puzzled faces across the room and every student would kind of have their mouth open. Nobody had ever heard this. They usually thought you meant James the fisherman. And when you go to Galatians, there is a James named, and he does seem to be head. But there's no record that James the fisherman is head of the movement. And in fact, he's beheaded by Herod uh, Agrippa, uh, in Acts chapter 12, and so he certainly didn't, he can't be the James in the book of Acts that later meets Paul and so forth, which is much later. So uh, the thing about it is, uh, who is this James? And, and I've had students so many times raise their hand, Dr. Tabor, what do you mean the brother of Jesus? So they immediately get into the theology, and if they're Roman Catholic or even Protestant, I taught at Notre Dame, as you know, they would say, I didn't know Jesus had any brothers. And I'll explain to them that there are three interpretations. Some are their children of Mary. The other interpretation of 
the Roman church tradition is that these are children of Joseph's brother Clophus. So they would be uh, dis, not that distant, but they would essentially be what, nephews and nieces. And then uh, one interpretation in the East is that they're children of Joseph from a previous marriage. So we go over all of that, but as we get into the text, we realize that this James brother of Jesus is not only so important, but, but he, he's just completely become unknown. How could it be that everybody knows Peter and Paul just like household names, but if you say James, they say James who? So something is going on, and I'm going to give you my theory as to why I think that happened. It's probably not going to surprise you, because it also is why John the Baptist was muted, and it's partly why Mary was muted and Mary Magdalene. So there's something going on. Here's a nice close-up of the inscription. Uh, this is the best drawing I've seen. I give credit to the artist, Shimon Gibson. Uh, my colleague, he's got a great artistic flair and he was interested. And I asked him, I said, so these scratches, they are just there for effect. He goes, James, if I draw an inscription and put scratches, every scratch is there. <laughs> so I thought, wow, I love that. So all these little things you see, that those are there if you look very closely at it. It's Aramaic, not Hebrew. And it's Yaakov is the Aramaic or Hebrew word for James. Bar, son of, Yosef, Akidu, brother of Yeshua, Jesus. So pretty simple. Here's a better picture of it. This is Oded Galan. Uh, he was accused of forgery and a couple of the, you know, several items uh, were in contest. I don't want to really talk about all the others, but uh, there was a forgery trial. It was very protected. Bar Magazine covered it very thoroughly. Uh, there were several reporters that sat in on the whole session. It lasted from 2005 to 2012, if you can believe it. And here is Oded getting his ossuary back and he was cleared of forgery uh, charges on all the counts. And the judge was quick to point out that he's not arguing that the, as a judge, how could he, that the testimony shows that the ossuary inscription is authentically first sent. By authentic, we mean ancient, not modern forgery. It's first century. He's not saying that. He's just saying uh, that Oded Galan by trial is, is pronounced not guilty, that there's no evidence that he forged it. Um, that came down to patina in the word Yeshua. This is the, this, this is the word Yaakov, uh, and I didn't have a close-up of Yeshua handy, but you can see when you magnify these things, you begin to see all kinds of little accretions and so forth. And as you know, patina, you know, everything acquires patina with age, right? Just about. And with stone, it's little microbiological crustaceans that you can't, you could pour a bunch into a crevice. And the, one of the theories was he, he ground up an authentic uh, ancient patina and mixed it in hot water and poured it on and kind of dug it in. But, but when it's examined forensically, that would just show some muck. Uh, the, the authentic patina actually grows out of the rock. Look, if you really magnify it, it looks like little mushrooms growing right out of the rock, meaning it's, it's a, a living kind of process. And so uh, the authentic patina was in the trial testified to by uh, Chris Rolston and others, even though Chris still thinks it's a forgery. And you can read his things too to cover that. This is at the end of the trial. You can see this is uh, 212, summer of 212. And here's the headline, Brother of Jesus inscription is authentic. That was Herschel's headline. Remember Herschel's, a, he's a lawyer, but he's got the eye and he's got the kind of flair of a reporter, you know, a headline writer. 
And so here he has, uh, that's Lori's picture right there. It's pretty cool, huh? Uh, I'm always glad that Lori got to have her pictures be part of this history. And uh, then Herschel wrote uh, this wonderful summary of it all, which you can get. Uh, it is also the July, August issue. So you could, if you don't have the magazines all the way back, or if you do, you can pull it out. And here's another one of Lori's pictures and you get the whole story. This is his editorial, Authentic or Forgery, Where Are We Now? Now, I was at the same time beginning to work on another tomb, which I'm not gonna talk about today, but that tomb contained an ossuary, Yeshua Bar, Yo Bar Yosef, Jesus, son of Joseph. And I did notice early on that this ossuary and this ossuary have some real similarities in the shape and the style of the lid. And this one's been weathered, this one hasn't. But uh, there was the possibility of trying to figure out where the James ossuary came from. That is, what tomb did it come from? And that's been pursued now over the years. Uh, this is what it looks like inside. You can see the inscription. Whenever you hear that an ossuary has been cleared or clean, I was just talking to Tina before the break. Dominus Flavit on the Mount of Olives has, uh, I think, up to 60 ossuaries from what seems to be a necropolis, many of which have names we associate with New Testament names, including Mary and Martha, Simon Barge excuse me, Simon Barjona and so forth. And the bones have been emptied out long ago. But look what you have. That's, that's bone. That is bone from the James Ossuary. These are other kinds of accretions. And you see how the body fluid goes up to the top when the bones begin to deteriorate. This is loaded with DNA, with the, with the new techniques of DNA. Uh, it's, it's a mixture of soil and DNA. Also, soil seeps into the limestone. <clears throat> so I have uh, commissioned some DNA tests on the James Ossuary, and I can't reveal the results yet. Uh, that'll get you coming back later, right? But I'm hoping maybe, uh, maybe within a year or so, because we've got to do some other tests. But uh, whether DNA is important or not, uh, this is important though, and you can get this, it's in the bibliography that I gave you. In fact, if you go to archeological discovery, which is uh, at script.org, you can find it. But it's the geochemistry of sediment uh, from the first century in the ossuary of James and the Taupio tomb in Jerusalem that had 10 ossuaries. So this is not patina, this is not DNA, this is the idea that every tomb has its own soil environment chemically, and it's what elements are in the soil. And it's a long technical article, but it's pretty, pretty impressive. And it was conducted by this whole team of Israeli scholars, Israel Geological Survey, and various other experts. And it's mainly authored by Arie Shimron. He was the lead. And the IA collected the soil, so no, no, it, there's a good chain of uh, evidence, uh, kind of a, a tree of evidence in terms of how it was tested. And then it was tested, blind tested. And uh, I forget how many tombs uh, it might say right here, but it, I think it was something like, uh, this is the abstract, I don't see it right away. I know it was something like 30 or 40 tombs were checked all around Jerusalem and got the profiles of the soil. And the conclusion is that the James Ossuary likely comes from the Telpio tomb. That's Shimron's uh, conclusion. You can read it yourself. It got a little bit of attention in the New York Times on page two and then sort of went away. People were tired of talking about the Telpio tomb. And I'm not gonna talk about it today, except you might not be aware of this because other than being talked about uh, here and there in the inner circles, it hasn't been pushed. It's on my blog, but it, it hasn't got picked up by any major media. So that's, uh, that's a little bit about the archeology span of the James Ossuary and how you might have material evidence 
that would actually link us to uh, Jesus himself, because that inscription could actually refer to Jesus of Nazareth. If so, that would be the first material evidence that, uh, of the first century that would ever refer to Jesus himself, our Jesus, the guy we know in the New Testament. As you can see here, uh, Yaakov, or Jacob equals Yaakov equals James. You know, that's kind of a big leap, uh, but think about uh, French and German and so forth. You know, you go to Jacques and you go to Jacques is a little more like Yaakov, but the names are equivalent. So we really should be calling him Jacob, but it's too late for that. Uh, all the Jameses in the uh, New Testament are called James, even though they're Jacobs. Now, what about uh, 60 times the name is used in the New Testament? Uh, some of them are clear. Jacob, the patriarch, Abraham's grandson. Nobody's claiming that's anybody but Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob, the father of Joseph, husband of Mary. In other words, in Matthew's genealogy, Joseph's father is called Jacob. One of you asked, how do we know that's Joseph's genealogy? You know, those last names we don't have record of. It is interesting that in genealogies, we often get a father named Jacob who names his son Joseph. Anybody want to guess why? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. So it, it's just a, kind of an, a way of uh, honoring your son and saying your son is in effect one of the tribes of Israel, even though, and you're like the patriarch. Then we got James, the son of Zebedee, brother of John the fisherman. They're called the sons of thunder. We have two main stories about them. One is when they want to toast a village that didn't accept Jesus. And they're rebuked pretty strongly. In fact, Jesus says, you don't know what spirit you're of. The other is when they ask for the chief places on the right and left hand when Jesus comes into his kingdom. They say, you know, they raise their hand. Uh, could, could we just ask, is it possible that my brother and I could be the two main guys next to you? And they were also rebuked for that. Uh, so their mother was also involved, by the way, according to... Uh, Matthew, he kind of takes, or uh, yeah, Luke doesn't even put the story in, I think, because he, maybe he doesn't want to shed a negative light on them. Anyway, this is the James, though, two stories on James, both kind of negative. This is the James that becomes the old man who's going around saying, love one another, and, you know, the first John, uh, John, which I personally don't think is the son of Zebedee, and I don't think the Gospel of John is written by the son of Zebedee. And, uh, you know, people argue about that. And I don't think he's the beloved disciple. Nothing against him, but I don't think he's the one. Then we got James, the son of Alphaeus, one of the 12. James the Less. That is a very unfortunate translation because it came to mean less as not greater. There's James the Great, that's this James, the beloved disciple. He's the main thing. And then there's eh, James the Less, he's not much. It doesn't mean less. It could mean short, but I don't think so. It, RSV puts younger. Uh, he's younger than this James, and so he's referred to as James the Younger to keep him straight. And he's the son of Mary. Uh, and maybe Clophus or maybe Joseph. Uh, we're just not sure because Mary, there's one theory that Mary, after Joseph's death, did remarry and have other children. And Alpheus and Clophus are similar names. We, we're just not sure of that. Then we got James, the brother of Joseph. That's definitely the Jesus family. That's the brother of the Lord. James, the brother of Judas. That's the brother of the Lord. And James, the brother of Jesus in Mark and Galatians. So I, I would say you can put these together as being our James. So if that's the case, we have two main Jameses. We have James, the son of Zebedee, and we have James, the son of Alphaeus. So we want to talk about James, the son of Alphaeus, or James, the son of Mary, let's call him. So I want to start with the Gospel of Thomas. Usually you don't start with... Um, Later texts, you start with earlier texts, but I've already covered some of the things 
in the book of Acts about James. So I want to go to this text because it is just so striking and because it gives you a better name to remember this James rather than calling it the less. How about the just? Yaakov Hasadik, James the Just One. And uh, that particularly is the name that he had in, in the first century and in all many, many of our sources, not in the New Testament. So in one of the sayings of the Gospel of Thomas, remember it's just sayings kind of like Q's teachings, 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 teachings. April DeConnick is probably, certainly, you, many of you have heard her, she, she and I have done bar things together, and she certainly is one of the world's experts on Thomas. I really respect her. She thinks that Thomas comes from the Jerusalem church and evolves in Gnostic directions in the second century, but that originally the core of Thomas, if you read her books on Thomas, are a Judeo-Christian version of the faith. And there's some real parallels to the Q material as well. So they're not influenced by Paul, uh, the early material. But here's the saying. The disciples said to Jesus, we know you will leave us. Who's going to be our leader then? And Jesus said to them, no matter where you go, you are to go to James the Just, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. Wow. That's like, what a statement. Not only James the Just, but for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. Now, we understand that from its Jewish background, there is the tradition within Second Temple Judaism, and particularly in later texts, of the Lamed Vavniks, this is later Talmud stuff, but the Lamed Vavniks, that means the, the 35, the Sanhedrin is 70, and the idea is that if you have 35, uh, no, it's actually 36, yeah, Vav. So 36, you would have a majority. And there developed this idea from Genesis that if you got down to 10 righteous, you wouldn't have to destroy a city. And if you could have 10 righteous, maybe you wouldn't have to destroy the world. So it's not like the world was created because of James, but he's one of the righteous ones that keeps God from destroying the whole world for its sin. That's sort of the idea. And so the 36 righteous, they... Uh, they're like salt that preserves the whole. Uh, it's a metaphor. So why did God create the heavens and the earth for whose sake heaven and earth came to being? So that even out of the mess of human history with all the evil and suffering and tragedy and shamefulness, there would emerge also sadikim, righteous ones. And if there's enough righteous ones, the world can go on. It's very similar to Malachi, the last verse of Malachi. Remember the Elijah figure, whom Jesus interprets as John the Baptist, is going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with utter destruction. So there's this idea that uh, he's one of those for whom the world still stands. You get the idea. So that's, that's major. Uh, I already talked about that. Uh, I would translate it as James the Younger, as far as the less. Now, here's what we normally think of. This is a Le Greco painting, very famous. Uh, and we've got Peter and Paul. And uh, they clearly uh, are, notice who has the key right here, so you can tell them apart, and who wrote the letters mainly. So this is Paul, this is Peter, and they are the two. They're the pillars. And James is not here. Where's James? And this is what happened. We almost lost him. If you go to the Vatican, I'll never forget my first visit to the Vatican. I walked into the rotunda with the ballast in, uh, that I think Napoleon brought from Egypt and walked up the steps, and I see over to the right, Paul, and over the left, Peter. And then I walk up the steps, and there's Jesus being 
held by his mother, the Pieta. And I'm thinking, I wonder if there'll be a statue of James somewhere. Because ideally, James should maybe be right here in the center. Because our tradition that we have is that he was in charge of things. Now, the book of Luke Acts is largely responsible for the standard portrait of early Christianity, which Peter and Paul assume, in which Peter and Paul assume such a dominant role, and James is largely left out. Remember when Luke, the author of Luke Acts published his work, and we think it might be even in the 90s to 100 AD. I know Arthur Droge and others are, I think Talbert, they're putting it even into 110. They think it's really late. But let's just say it's at the, toward the end of the first century. Um, remember, there's no future at that time when it's published. You don't have church histories like Hegesippus. They don't exist. You don't have even Eusebius, who preserves so many documents. So do you see how this becomes the definitive history of the church? And James, as you know, in this definitive history of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, is barely included, and even though he's mentioned, we're going to look at the references again, he's not identified as the brother of the Lord, and he's really not identified as in charge, but he's obviously in charge, and so Luke can't really deny that, so it's like he's presented in charge, but you're going to say, well, who is he? He's never distinguished from James's son as evident. He's not really well, maybe he is an X1, I guess you could say, because the brothers are mentioned. But it, it's just, you'll see in a minute, and we already, I'll show you the same slide I showed you under Mary. So Mary, what happens in the book of Acts? Mary the mother fades out. Bye-bye, Mary. Acts 114, last mention of Mary. Paul, please mention Mary. No, Jesus is born of a woman. Even though he certainly knew her name, he visited Jerusalem, he's met Mary. So uh, maybe that's just the expression born of a woman of those born of a woman, you know, that, that you're flesh and blood. But the point is, Paul never mentions Mary. Mary Magdalene is never mentioned. We saw that yesterday. Well, I mean, she presided and led the burial of Jesus. She's certainly around. Why isn't she highlighted? Why isn't she mentioned? Other women are mentioned in Luke. In fact, Luke mentions women quite often and highlights the leadership role of women, right? Like at Philippi and so forth. And so why Marian, the Mary and Martha story that he has also in chapter, I forget which chapter, we'll do that tomorrow. <clears throat> but he mentions the Mary and Martha story. So he, knows, he highlights women, but Mary Magdalene is gone. Mary Magdalene is gone. John the baptizer is minor and superseded. Remember, very quickly, in Luke, Jesus, it doesn't even say Jesus is baptized by John. Now, of course he is, but he doesn't explicitly say, and he came to John, and he said, I want to be baptized, and John said, okay, I'll baptize you, and then John objected, and Jesus said, it's nothing like that. It just says, when all the people were baptized, and Jesus was baptized as he was praying. Uh, so it's just a way of not emphasizing the encounter with John. And then when you get to other chapters of Acts, it's very clear that uh, John the Baptist is a forerunner. He doesn't baptize with the Holy Spirit. He doesn't really, it's not the baptism of Christ. It's not the baptism of salvation. It's not Christian baptism. So he's, he's a precursor, but not a main character. Peter fades by Acts 10 and 11. He's pretty well gone. You get him a little bit later. And Paul takes center stage. So that becomes our history. And yet we do have sources later than that that correlate with these sources. The challenge for Luke is how to deal with James. Uh, this is me saying this. He's muted, marginalized, while at the same time presented as in charge, almost without being in charge. So in Acts 12, when Peter gets out of prison, go tell this to James and the brothers. So 
you go, the first time he's mentioned by name, Acts 12, you go, James who? who are, who's James and the brothers? Well, the brothers are mentioned in Acts 1 with Mary, but the name James is not mentioned. And let me remind you of this. When Luke gives the Nazareth scene about, is this not Mary, the son? Uh, is this not Jesus, the son of Mary, and are not his brothers with us, James, Joseph, Simon, and Jude? Luke just takes all that out. He doesn't even put that in. He didn't put the names of the brothers anywhere. He takes it out of his source. Mark, he's playing down the family, and he's playing up Paul. Uh, he's, of course, Paul is his hero. This is very important because the major decision the early church made was around 50 AD when they decided, what are we going to do with Gentiles who come to faith in Christ as Messiah, and they're baptized and they receive the Holy Spirit? Do they need to also begin keeping the Torah or part of the Torah, or how should they live ethically? And after hearing from Peter and Paul in Acts 15, James stands up and says, my decision is, and he dictates a letter that is sent to all the churches, uh, presumably worldwide. So he's the, you know, people today say the Pope, he's the Bishop of Jerusalem, he's head of the church, not Peter. Peter speaks, but James stands up. After this, James replied, my decision is. Um, here is Acts 21. Paul is coming up to Jerusalem years later, and he goes in first thing to see James and the elders. As he goes to the headquarters, he goes to see James. My guess is they're probably meeting on Mount Zion in the little, the little building that we've talked about where I think the family live, Mary and the, the kids. And uh, essentially James and and is in charge, and he questions Paul about, are you teaching Jews? Uh, we decided Gentiles don't have to keep the Torah, but of course, Jews have to keep the Torah, even if they're Christian, right? Paul didn't answer. He didn't go, oh. But in his letters, he says, well, you know, to the Jew, I become as a Jew, though I'm not really under the law, 1 Corinthians 9. And to the non-Jews, I become as though I'm not a Jew. And he rebukes Peter for following that and then going back on it when James shows up in the book of Galatians. Because James is eating with Gentiles, which a strict Jew would not do for kosher and other ritual purity reasons. And yet when James's people show up, Peter moves over to the Jewish table, so to speak, and kind of like, what, me? No, I'm here with my Jewish brethren. And Paul stands up and says, you know what? You're hypocritical. Because if you, being a Jew, live like a Gentile, like you just were sitting at their table, then how could you possibly compare, uh, compel the Gentiles to live like Jews, since you as a Jew don't even live like a Jew? So it, it, was, a, it was a pretty sharp rebuke. We don't get Peter's reply, but I think he probably got the point. So who is this James? Book of Acts doesn't really tell you clearly. Uh, I don't know if late first century readers would necessarily know because James has been dead for 30, almost 30 years, 70, 80, 90, if it's in the 90s. Uh, so they might not know, the readers might not know, but Paul is early, Paul's from the 50s, and he talks about, I went up to see Peter, and I stayed with him two weeks, this is Galatians 1. And I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. So there he makes it clear. When I say James, it's the Lord's brother. And then this is Acts. This is the same as Acts 15. We think this is the meeting when they're going to decide what to do about the Gentiles. And it says, when they perceive the grace given to me, Paul talked about I'm baptizing Gentiles. They're faithful. They're living moral lives. They're, they worship the one God. They're not committing fornication. They're abstaining from meat offered to idols and from blood, which was forbidden even for Gentiles in Genesis 9 after the flood. Remember, Gentiles are not supposed to eat blood either, not just Jews. It's not part of the law of Moses. And it doesn't originate with the law of Moses, although it's in the law of Moses. So anyway, he says, uh, when they perceived, who, who perceived? James, 
Cephas, Kaphas, that's Peter, as we know him in Greek. This is his Aramaic name, the rock, and John. So his name is Simon Bar Jonah, Simon son of Jonah. And he gets the nickname Peter in Greek, which means, you know, Petros, rock, and Kephas. And this is John, the son of Zebedee, I take it. So he's certainly prominent at this point, James, Kephas, and John, who were reputed to be pillars. Now, I didn't put it up here because I don't want to slam them, but he does mention this twice. And then he, in one of the places, he says, what they are means nothing to me, which is another question, whether Paul accepted their authority. Certainly, if it contradicted his visionary experience, he did not accept it. And there's a whole split in the movement later that's reflected in the Judeo-Christian writings called the Pseudo-Clementines, who see Paul as an apostate from the law. They're later called the Ebionites. But anyway, uh, he does name the pillars. These are the three leaders. And he says that they shook hands and agreed or hugged each other, the right hand of fellowship, and uh, the idea is, Paul, you go do what you're doing. You're doing the right thing. They don't need to convert to Judaism. And we'll go to the circumcision worldwide. So the Jerusalem church had a worldwide mission. They weren't just staying in Jerusalem. They, they believe that, remember, there, there's a, a Jewish diaspora all over the Mediterranean world and even maybe in other countries. And they felt that they've got to go preach the gospel to the circumcision. So it's a big job. It's not just a few hundred Jews in Jerusalem that need to hear it. Uh, here's where uh, Peter's rebuke. Certain men came from James. He also mentions the appearance of Jesus to James, Peter, and then James. And so James is a kind of a, also one of the first witnesses to the resurrection, then all the apostles. So there's appearances to Peter, to the 12, to James, all the apostles, and the five, group of 500. Uh, we don't know the exact order of those because those seem to be doublets the way they're mentioned. But the idea of Jesus appearing to James is not in any of the Gospels. Like, why doesn't Luke have that? If he's going to have Jesus appearing in Jerusalem for 40 days, surely he could have uh, gone and seen his brother. But it's not mentioned but it's in the early tradition. And finally, Paul mentions the brothers of the Lord and how they travel about with their wives, preaching and teaching the gospel, the brothers of the Lord. Now, you know about the missionary work of Thomas, supposedly to India. We have stories of Matthew. We have stories of all the apostles and where they went, right? To the circumcision primarily. We don't have any stories of the brothers of the Lord going on mission. This is uh, lost. It's essentially lost to us. But notice, uh, Paul knows who they are. He probably met them. May, I'm sure they visited Corinth. Um, in fact, when he says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. He could very well have the brothers in mind. We've also got James, a servant of God. Uh, did I go over time? No, I got 10 minutes. Good. James, servant of God, the Lord Jesus, to the 12 tribes. This James. and also Jude, servant uh, of Christ and brother. Or did I go over time? Am yes, over? you did. <laughs> 1245. Okay. So let me just finish real quick. Uh, this has to do with James going to the 12 tribes. Uh, sources outside the New Testament. Very quickly, the succession of the church passed to James. This is from our earliest record, Hegesippus. He's a Jewish Christian of the second century. Here are the other references you'll get. If you want to do a screenshot, I'll pause just a minute here. They're also in your reading that I gave you on the bibliography. So if you're fast at a screenshot, go ahead and get those. And James was killed in 63. There's a great article that Murphy O'Connor writes about how he's thrown off the uh, pinnacle of the temple here on the south East corner and his his uh, his original tomb is in the Kidron. Josephus has a passage on the murder of James. That's really significant. And just like John the Baptist, I wouldn't I wouldn't take a word of this out. Uh, isn't that interesting that he would mention James? 
And then we have Hegesippus's account of the murder of James. It's really touching to read because he's essentially, there it is, a picture's worth a thousand words. He's thrown off the temple, stoned and beaten to death with a club. Finally, and I can end with this, this is Jesus, this is James. Look, look how they kind of look similar. And this is Peter. Now, some have interpreted Peter looking over and going, oh, I'm angry. Why are you looking to my brother and letting him be the successor? My guess was, we don't know the artist that's in the DC gallery. My guess is the artist wanted to convey that. That the artist is saying, you know, if you read those sources that I said you could take a screenshot of, Jesus chose James as his successor, not Peter. I know that contradicts Matthew 16, and that would be great for a question. 